it's time for its episodes with quick tips you should know techniques you can implement into your workflow right here on a tale a tale oh yeah a tale of two hygienists welcome back everyone to another tip episode and this week i am on vacation so we are going to rebroadcast one of my favorite tip episodes from last year about leadership because there's lots of great takeaways from that episode. And one of the big ones is that nobody has all the answers. And I think that if we look at our leaders, if we think about leaders, we think, hey, you have to be perfect or you have to know everything. And that's just, it's not possible. So if you're in a leadership position or you're looking at getting into one, please don't pretend to know it all. It's just not a good look. Um, there are several other great takeaways, but big picture, everyone, life isn't long enough to learn everything that we need to know for every situation. Leadership is a lifelong journey. So to that end, I really do hope that you're forgiving yourselves and also others for the mistakes that are being made pretty much on a daily basis. We're always on this learning path. And sometimes people have to learn the lessons in different stages of their life. Sometimes you learn a certain skill before you learn a certain lesson and vice versa. It doesn't make them bad. It doesn't make them stupid. It doesn't make them bad at their job. It's just the way it is. So you know, lots of forgiveness as we're thinking about, you know, leadership. It's tough being a leader, but I hope that this episode helps you out in some way. I will be back next week with some new episodes. Thank you so much for listening and have a great weekend, everyone. Welcome back, everyone. I am so excited to speak with you today. It's been a little bit since I've done a tip episode and pretty excited to do this. So I wanted to talk about leadership today because I feel like it's a conversation that as hygienists, we don't always necessarily have to have because we have a leader in our office. Usually we have an office manager, we have a doctor owner. We usually have someone there to be the leader that we don't always have to be the leader. But I think that as we're seeing the changes in the economy or as we're seeing changes in the profession, leadership is more valuable now than ever. And it can, the words I'm going to say to you today, I mean, I hope it can be applicable to everybody, but I really do think that it's going to be geared a little bit more towards the people that are on the path of becoming a leader or maybe even those that are already currently leaders. There's essentially two paths, and you know, I've been a part of leadership for probably actually since I was pretty young, but true responsibility given to me as a leader probably didn't happen until I was around 20 years old. I told you all the story before, but as a young person, as a young man, I went over to the Philippines and did a mission trip, and I was there for two years. And it isn't just kind of going over there and hanging out and you know having fun for two years. You know, There's responsibility there you're essentially taking care of yourself, which is, you know, as a, as a 20 year, as a 19, 20 and 21 year old, that's not all that hard to do. You know, we go away to college. You've all have probably done that as well. But there was additional responsibilities given to you kind of depending on who the people that you were in charge of. And, you know, in my particular mission in the Philippines, you know, we also had the additional responsibilities of learning a language and we had the additional responsibilities of learning a culture. And also geographically, we are moving from city to city. And so we had to, you know, quickly learn the lay of the land. And, you know, it was just, it was just very interesting early option for responsibility. When I came back, I was given more responsibility in retail leadership and things like that. And then I was fortunate enough to have some leadership responsibilities at school. And I mean, it's just, it's been a part of, of who I've been pretty much my whole entire adult life. The reason why I tell you all of that, it's not like, oh, hey, look how great I am. I'm, I've been a leader for a long time, so listen to me. It's not that. It's just that the way my brain works is I, I try and see patterns. And I think part of it is just to make my life easier. But part of it is also being able to adapt to a certain situation. So that's why I feel like I do worse in situations where I don't already know the people, the places, the objectives. If I don't understand why we're doing what we're doing, I have a harder time as opposed to those situations where, you know, I've been there before, I know the people, you know, when I go to conferences, I, I usually hang out with the same people because I already know them. Unless there is that really Michelle Hudson type of personality where you know, you're really just pretty extroverted, very loving, welcoming, kind. So when I look at these patterns of leadership, I see essentially two, there's a traditional path. And these would be the ones that you know, think of if you want to be the president of the United States. Before they were elected, where did the presidents almost always come from? Right? They're almost always either a governor or they came out of Congress. Well, what did they do before that? If you look, it's actually a surprising number of people, if not a surprising list, uh, who they were lawyers. They went to law school and they graduated and they took the bar and they were lawyers. For most of the presidents were lawyers. In the earlier times, they were 
generals or they went through the ranks of the military and then ended up being a president. And so it's a pretty predictable pathway if you think about it. And so if you want to be the president of the United States, you kind of have that path, that model already built out. Now, it's not to say that someone outside of that model couldn't do it, but generally that's kind of how it goes. But then there's usually another pathway. It's the non-traditional pathway. It's that person or someone who sees and understands the regular path, but thinks that they can forge a new one that's a little bit more effective. They're creators, they're innovators. Simon Sinek once asked, why is Apple so innovative? He said, essentially, they're a computer company, just like everyone else out there. But year after year, they have all these new innovations and the consumer loves all of the upgrades generally, <laughs> loves the upgrades that they come up with. And why is it like that? It's because it's their leadership. They are a non-traditional leadership structure or have been for years. And if you're listening to this episode or really any of our other episodes, this is you. You are Apple-esque, I guess. You are taking a newer way of consuming information, podcasts, and making it a normal part of your life. And I think it's hard to guesstimate, you know, the way that podcasting work, you don't really know how many subscribers you have. You only know how many downloads you have, but Let's assume that we have 10,000 individuals listening to us each month, at least one time. They're maybe not the, the normal subscriber, but they, they'll tune in for at least one of our shows. That is only 5%. That 10,000, only 5% of hygienists in the United States. And that is incredible. You think about 10,000, oh my gosh, that's a big number. That is such a small number by percentage. But that's you. You're the early adopter. It's a way to go. You're taking a non-traditional path and hopefully, you know, our goal, of course, is that you're going to be a better person for it. You know, I made a comment on the intro a few days ago about a clinician having recently been appointed as VP of the American Dental Hygienist Association. Finally, right? A clinician getting the opportunity to really be a leader. And I mentioned also that there are so many times that people come into leadership positions and they forget their roots. And so to clarify this, I wasn't only talking about the ADHA, although this very specific example did include them. And yes, they do have a lot of work that needs to be done to bridge the gap better, but it wasn't just about them. I was more talking about any lead hygienist in the offices, a newly promoted office manager, a dental hygiene director at a DSO, a program director at a hygiene program. Because there's sometimes this big misconception that once someone gets into these positions, they're set. They made it, it's done. And so if this is you, or if this is going to be in your future, if you're going to be taking a leadership position at one of these types of things, my biggest advice is just be kind. Please be someone who fights for the hygienists that are still seeing patients because they really are the backbone. Without them, we have nothing. You can't be a leader of nothing. And while it's trite, you need to put that shoe on the other foot. When you are working clinically, what kind of leader did you need and what kind of support would you have appreciated? because it almost takes no effort at all to be nice and helpful. There's a disgusting truth about leadership in many types of organizations. And the truth is that a leader in the middle, as middle management, so to speak, you often do not get to be that person that changes the tone for the whole company. You know, you'll have input to you know, the, the people that are higher up, but to change the culture of an entire company, that's the people at the top that can do that. And unfortunately, many of them and this is, again, across all organizations and all industries, many of them do not realize that they have that level of responsibility, or maybe they completely ignore it because they do not know how to be a good steward. So they model the horrible behaviors that were exhibited and shown to them in the past, and they just don't know how to overcome it. But they're the next ones in line, and so they end up getting the job or the, you know, called up to the big league, so to speak. And so when that becomes you, or even now as you know, middle management or lower management, however you want to look at it, but someone who has a responsibility over somebody else, you have to make a choice. Do you keep up with that status quo or do you change your own little corner of the world? And it's scary to sometimes like step out of that rank and file, especially if there's a tradition, which I think is very common in dental practices of not accepting outside ideas, right? This is what I was you know, taught in school. This is the way it's always going to be, right? But the first step for you to be a really good leader is just to be open to new ideas. In your corner of the world, be open to the new ideas from the people that you are a leader to. Ask them for their input. Seriously and truly consider 
and implement their suggestions. If someone sees their suggestion being implemented, they are going to be loyal to that person for a really, really long time until there's something that causes them to lose that loyalty. But if there's something that's wrong with that suggestion, I implore you, please ask them, you know, hey, here's your suggestion. I would love to do it, but here's my obstacle to implementing this. Help me figure out how to do this because I don't know how to do it. But be honest and open with them that you don't know how to do it either and make them a part of that solution. There's been so many times in my career, I feel like, you know, I've had suggestions that would have vastly improved companies. When the AAP rolled out the new Perio classifications, I was there. I was at Euro Perio, as you all know. And I came back with all the excitement in the world and I, I wanted to implement that into our company. I think it would have been an easy implementation, but they didn't want to hear it. They weren't listening to me. And I think it's because they didn't know how to implement it or they, they, you know, they have a, a quote unquote protocol for implementing things like that. And they just weren't accepting of new ideas. And it's unfortunate because we could have been an early adopter. We would have been one of the first big group practices to do that and to do it right, and it would have been amazing. If you are being measured, as, again, as a leadership position person, I don't wanna keep saying middle management because that sounds terrible, it reminds me of retail, but if you're being measured on metrics of improvement, meaning this is where we were last year, this is where we need to be this year kind of improvements, I promise you that you cannot do that alone. You do not have all of the answers, nobody does. And so we have so many amazing clinicians out there that can help you if you'll listen. And another suggestion is that you really should be actively learning leadership skills from non-dental people. It's kind of counterintuitive, but if you want to stir up that creativity, you can't be inside that dental echo chamber that we have. It's the same idea as being thrown out over and over again, recycled over and over again. A simple Google search will help you get started and then just start going down that rabbit hole and that other rabbit hole of leadership. Because I have newsletters coming in about every day. There's a number of topics, business, marketing, uh, you know, podcasts, of course, <laughs> financials, they're like the entertainment industry. I don't always get to every single one of them, but when I do, I can feel the creativity just starting to go. I feel energized about opening my mind to new things. Another thing that I do is I follow leadership accounts on LinkedIn. It, it's not necessarily people, but it's like pages, like leadership pages. And it's been really inspirational. And there's been many times that it would actually give me pause. It would make me think about my own behaviors and inter interactions with my coworkers. You know, how can I make sure that this isn't happening to them or this isn't happening to me or I'm not doing that or they're not doing that. If you'll give into that and not be, you know, too cool for school, then that is really, really helpful. YouTube has catalogs of TED Talks on different topics and the leadership and business ones are certainly compelling as well. So don't feel like you can't go to YouTube. There's plenty of great stuff on there too. You'll spend hours and hours watching just anything. And I don't think that you really have to know where to start. So don't feel like, if like, Andrew, where do I, where do I start? What, like, what account do I watch first? Just type in leadership and just start somewhere and let the algorithm take over. And the reason why I say that is because the algorithms right now, like while they're, you know, it's, I don't want to say they're almost dangerous, but they can kind of be a little bit dangerous. But if they're feeding you the same thing that other leaders are, are doing, again, outside of dentistry, then it's going to be a good starting point. And then once you get a feel for it, you'll know how to search for different keywords to bring up different videos or different thoughts. So don't be afraid of it. I would say definitely embrace it. One of the reasons why I bring this up though about watching you know, a variety of things is it's something I actually learned from my boys, my sons. So they watch these very interesting science experiments on YouTube and they're, they're not the ones that are for kids that have like the science kits that come with them. They're the ones that are for like maybe like high school, probably even actually beyond high school. It's probably more college level chemistry classes. You know, an example of some of the things that they watched, there's one that was about changing a piece of wood into frosted glass. And then there's another one that takes a bunch of Tums and turns them into crystals. And they're very tedious. Like these videos are, I don't want to say they're boring. They're not boring, but they're very tedious episodes that show every single step using all of the scientific terms. They point out every mistake and why that mistake probably happened. There's a lot of, you know, hypothesis. It's the whole scientific method. And then they have a really nice voice narration over the top of it. So why do they watch them though? It, they have zero interest in being scientists themselves or doing these experiments. They're not going to be going into my garage and possibly blowing it up. I'm not worried about that. 
But I've seen them over the years, how they'll take some of these notions of things that they learn and they'll put them into different aspects of their lives. Say, my well, Father's Day has just happened, right? So they'll take these, these interesting concepts and they'll put them into Father's Day cards. And they make these beautiful cards that took them a long time with intricate folds or clever concepts that have like moving pieces to them. And so I tell you all this because this could be you, like you could be that sponge on all things leadership. And when the time is right, you'll know how to use those tools. Also be patient. I saw a post today about a hygienist who's making more than $50 an hour. I think she also was getting 401k match, but it seemed like she wanted to leave based on the post because she wasn't getting the best vacation time. She was asked, I think, to find her own temps if she was going to be gone. And for the record, the list of things that she had listed out, it was a joke that she was being asked to do all of that. Like, I'm, I'm not saying that that isn't the right thing, but she knew what she was getting into when she made the commitment to them. They laid that all out there for her, that this was the job you were taking. And she was a new grad making over 100000 a year. And how many of us out there have never made $100,000 a year? There's quite a few of us. And so there's so much for her to learn about being a hygienist, about, you know, the timing and the, you know, instrumentation and, and, you know, just working on customer service and all of those different things. And she'll get to do all that while she's making great money. But in her mind, she was being told by all of these other people, no, get out, get out. That's a scary place. And, and yes, by the way, regional considerations do apply about the whole hundred thousand dollars not being enough. And I don't know her personal situation if she had 20 kids and had to, you know, make sure that she's able to take care of them and she needed insurance and this and that. I don't know all of those things. But generally, though, $100,000 across every state is decent pay. It's not terrible pay. So if she would be patient as, again, as a new grad, she can build that resume and her experience and be ready for that next big offer to come her way. And she'll be ready for it, but they'll be ready for her. And there'll be a perfect match. I'm not advocating that anyone stay in any abusive situation, so please be very clear that I'm not saying that, but we do have to endure some difficulty in our lives in order to grow, so embrace those opportunities when they come your way. And I'm going to end on this story, and just so you know, the moral of the story is just don't be petty. I thought I would say that now because I know it's been a long episode so far, so in case you're done listening to me app on, like that's the thing, just don't be petty, and then you can flip it off. But I was called last month by a lawyer representing someone from a previous place of employment. The lawyer represented the place of employment and not the the other person. And so I assume what they wanted was for me to give my testimony or, you know, give them information telling them, the company, that they did nothing wrong. But I didn't get to the phone call and I just I heard the voicemail and and whatever. I never called back. Then I heard, you know, over the next couple of days that through the grapevine that I was not the only one that was contacted. There were several people that were contacted, both current and former employees. And I was like, oh, that's, that's very interesting. They're, they're really taking this seriously and doing their due diligence because they must have a legitimate concern. And, you know, it was kind of a little bit sad for me because I was with this company for a really long time. I really loved their mission and the ability I had to work with my doctors because my doctors were awesome. And they gave us the ability to treat our patients the right way. And I truly believe, truly, truly, that there's no better place to receive hygiene care than at one of these offices, at least the the clinics that I worked at. Everyone had the right reason for being there. But I will tell you, as a company, though, they did me wrong so many times, and many of them probably had legal ramifications with it. So when the lawyer called a second time and let the message call back, I did have a split second like emotional response to make just a giant scene for all the damage they had done. Now, I know truly, though, that that never would have gotten anywhere. It would have stayed with that one lawyer. They never would have told anyone and whatever. So what would that have accomplished? I would be doing the same thing that they did to me, being spiteful and petty, always looking to hurt someone back or hurt them before they hurt myself or one of us. If we work in this state of pettiness, in this state of being spiteful and, and all of this, There is no chance, zero chance that's not going to spill over into our personal lives. Ask me how I know. Ask my wife how I know. Pettiness is a powerful drug. It corrupts great people and makes them do very questionable things. You cannot give in to it. You cannot be that person that is petty. Whether you're a leader or not a leader, this is, I guess, for both of you, like 
you just can't do that. You need to fight those urges. So I appreciate your listening to me today. I know that I get very long winded, especially about subjects I'm very passionate about. So a quick summary of my thoughts in case you've kind of zoned out, you got to take that step away from the norm and go on that other non-traditional path. Be your own kind of leader who leads with compassion and kindness backed by thoughtfulness and inquisitiveness, but someone who also has the skills and the tools to be a leader. You can't be in a leadership position without those foundational tools, but don't be afraid to be you. Also be patient because great things come to those people who are really worth it. If you have any thoughts or questions, of course, you can email me, Andrew at A Tale of Two Hygienist. Thank you so much for listening to me. Have a great weekend, everyone. A Tale of Two Hygienists.